Switch them on. I just read it from the inside. Thank you. Like I'm supposed to. <clears throat> this is the fourth Sunday of Advent. And we'll title this, We Give You a Sign. We're going to read it from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10 through 16. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. Isaiah said that the Lord spoke to the king and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shill or high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God wants us to know, even when we aren't sure ourselves, God wants us to experience God's presence. Even when we think we can handle life on our own, God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open 
and look. <clears throat> look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. We light these, these candles, the candles of joy, hope of proclaimed peace of deep everlasting joy and today of <clears throat> present that speaks of love as a sign that no matter our first circumstances, we know we are not alone. at First Presbyterian. Can you believe that Christmas is one week from today? One week. Are you ready? I know a good way to get you ready. Our Christmas Eve service is going to be down in the Family Life Center on Saturday night at 6 p.m. It'll be full of lots of music. We'll have communion. We'll have candle lighting. Um, and then on Sunday morning, after you've already opened your presents, you can come to worship at 930. We're going to have one service here in the sanctuary at 930 on next Sunday. All of our activities are open to all of our church family, as well as our community. If you know somebody that would like to come to a fantastic Christmas Eve service, bring them along on Saturday night. Those red pads on the center aisle seat are for attendance. If you would please print your name and pass it to your neighbor, we would love to know that you are worshiping with us this morning. And after the service today, you can go on down to the Family Life Center, have a cup of coffee and a goodie with your friends. Now, as you are able, let's stand for our call to worship. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your hand make us strong. Give us life. Now let's continue our worship by singing, O come, all ye faithful.
Let us confess to God and before one another our sins and especially the duplicity we, in which we live our lives. We confess to you, O God, and before one another that we have sinned. We take our place in worship as followers of Jesus, yet out in the world we are likely to follow the leadings of the world. We talk of the great love of God, and yet the world perceives us as full of hostility and hatred. We claim to be sisters and brothers of the one who ate and shared with sinners, but we are too, to not allow such people to get too close to us. Forgive our double-mindedness and cleanse us with the power of your spirit so that we may truly reflect your creator and redeemer. Amen. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. That whining that you hear is our organ complaining about the cold weather. <laughs> our scripture reading comes from the Psalm, Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7, and then 17 through 19. And we will read this responsively. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. You have fed them. With the bread of tears, you have made them drink tears by the bowlful. <clears throat> Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
That leads us into our prayer time together. And I have a number of prayer requests. Sandy Morin is still recovering at Oasis, so we need to keep her in our prayers. Also, Betty Silguero is in the hospital in, in Mesa, uh, awaiting some more surgery. She did have a heart attack, and but she also has gallstones, and they're concerned about having surgery uh, in her con with the condition of her heart. Also, we need to keep Sheriff Lamb and his family in our prayers. A son and granddaughter were killed in a car accident. Also, prayers for Lou and Joy Mayer uh, with some health concerns. Um, so we need to keep them in our prayers as well. So let's join together and pray together as God's beloved children. We praise and worship you, our God of salvation, for you are the one who comes to us with no deceit. You are who you say you are, and you act out of the integrity of your being. We give you thanks for all the blessings you have bestowed on us. You have given us your great creation, your love, and your Son. We are truly blessed. During this season, we are reminded once again that you are always with us, in us, and among us. We thank you, Lord, for this day, this beautiful day that you have given to us. We are guaranteed no other. We bring to you our, the cares of our hearts, and we offer our prayers, our love, and lives so that all might be used in your great work of salvation. Empower us with your physical presence among the broken and the hurting of our world so that they may find wholeness in you and rejoice with us in your love. We ask that you intercede in all of the prayer requests that have been spoken aloud and those that we keep in our hearts. All these things we pray through our only Savior, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's stand once more and sing Angels from the Realms of Glory.
whenever we have a, a younger person in our congregation, I like to talk to them for just a second. I was going to ask you, do you have a name? Yes. Yes, your parents gave you a name? Yes. Oh, what is your name? Olivia. Olivia, that's a beautiful name, isn't it? Wow, do you, does that mean something? Does that mean that name have a meaning? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know that Paul had a meeting uh, either until I read the Bible and I found out that uh, there was a guy named Saul who became Paul. And uh, that was interesting um, uh, to me in the Bible. Did, did you read along with us when we rang, uh, read our psalm this morning when Bill was leading us? No. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I, you probably weren't alone because <clears throat> we were... We were stretched. You, you can sit down. Thank you so much for talking to me. Um, uh, we were stretched linguistically a little bit, weren't we, by the psalm this morning? Those names, what were they, Travis? Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. That last one's always a, a, a hard one for me to remember how to say. Old Testament names, you have to love them, don't you? Now, these were pretty mild compared to some Old Testament names. Uh, names, you know, the prophet Isaiah loved long names. In fact, the longest word in the Bible is found in Isaiah. Um, why don't you show us that? Yeah. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, take thee a great roll and write in with it a man's pen concerning Mahershalal Hashbaz. <laughs> that doesn't trip off the tongue, and it's not something I would use in casual conversation either. And, and you know, you know that famous uh, uh, verse from the Bible, and uh, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and all of that. That's also found in Isaiah, but also it's found in the English or the Hebrew to English translation as this. For a child is born unto us, a son is given, and the government is upon and his name shall be called Pele Yohaz El Gibber Abi Ad Shah Shalom. Now I thought about naming my my son that, but you know what would you call him for short? I I, I don't know. So, <laughs> all right, Pele. Yeah, that's a soccer season, right? That'd be a good a good name. You know, um, the Old Testament is full of those uh, long names because they usually mean something. There is meaning embedded in that name. You know, the last word is shalom, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall reign in peace. Our scripture today tells us what's in a name. It comes from the book of Matthew, the first chapter. We're learning about how the birth of Jesus comes about, and it, as my wife Elizabeth uh, told me, well, wouldn't you know, they tell it this time from the point of view of the guy of the man. I mean, come on, Mary did all the work. Well, I think God did most of the work, but, well, pray with me, please. Creator God, Heavenly Father, once again we stand before your open book. Grant us the grace to find our lives in your holy story. Amen. This is the word of God. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. 
the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word of the Lord. Pray with me, please. Give me Emmanuel, Lord. Give me Emmanuel. They can have all of the rest. Just give me Emmanuel. Amen. What is it about a name? What is in a name? Jesus seems to have had two, uh, not Christ, not at first. That actually came later. His father wasn't Joseph Christ, you know. He was probably called Joseph ben Jacob, since so that was the name of his father. Changing names uh, seems to be important. Jesus, like we said, seems to have two. Um, but his names are Jesus and Emmanuel. Now, changing names is something that happens all the time, even happened back in Jesus' day. You know, Roman uh, emperors changed their name frequently. Uh, Gaius Octavius, the first emperor, changed his name to Caesar Augustus, probably to honor his great uh, grand uncle, Julius Caesar. Um, Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus went by his first name of Nero, sort of like share. <laughs> that didn't work out for him all that well, but you see, the same is true today, really. Woody Allen? Nope. Allen Stewart Konigsberg. He even spells Allen differently than his given name. How about Michael Caine? You know, he decided to be an actor. He thought he needed a more commanding name than the one his parents gave him, Maurice Joseph Micklewhite. When he converted to Islam, Yusuf Islam changed his name from Cat Stevens. And of course, his parents didn't hate him. They didn't give him the name Cat. He, he was born Stephen Dimitri Georgiou. And John Wayne, what a great commanding movie actor. He needed a commanding name like John Wayne. Most people, though, today know that he was originally named Marion Robert Morrison. Now, today, that may not have made as much of a big deal a difference when we have big movie stars like Dwayne Johnson. But back in the day, it meant something. You needed a commanding name. If you didn't know that one, you might know these two. Judy Garland was named Francis Ethel Gum. I love the name Ethel, by the way. I had a good friend in Hilton Head by the name Ethel. But I think you have to admit, hey, Ethel, sing another verse of Over the Rainbow again, will you? Just doesn't have that same ring to it. And, of course, Marilyn Monroe's original name was Norma Jean Baker. And doesn't everybody know that... Uh, Muhammad Ali was an originally named what? Cassius Clay. Yeah, that's right. In the uh, lots of reasons to change your name. Some change religion or have their status changed. There's a lots of reasons. In the 1930s, an uh, ex-slave by the name of Martin Jackson explained why he and a lot of others chose their last names after emancipation. Now, the master's name was usually taken as the former slave's uh, uh, last name after they were free, and it was done more because it was the expedient and logical thing to do rather than any affection they might have had for the former masters. Um, Jackson himself says, the government seemed to be in an almighty hurry to have us get names. We had to register as someone 
so we could be citizens. He says, well, I got to thinking about all us slaves that were going to take the name Fitzpatrick, and I made up my mind to take a different one. One of my grandfathers in Africa was called Jackio, so I decided to be Martin Jackson. It's not just people who change their name. By the way, I have two people to thank. I'm indebted to the sermon today from a sermon written by Henry Brighton and Carl Wilton. I believe those are still their original names. Found on homiletics online. They write that this is the first year that the Washington, D.C. National Football League team has been called the Commanders. Now, for 87 years, they were the Redskins, a name that was found disparaging to Native Americans. And then for two years, they were simply the Washington football team. I kind of liked that, actually. I kind of wish they had held on to that name. But uh, it turns out that uh, the president of the team, Jason Wright, said, the commanders is something that embodies the values of service and leadership that characterizes the D.C. region. If you're looking for a commanding name, you couldn't have a better choice than the commanders. And service and leadership are good qualities, but not everyone loves the new name. Commanders doesn't really connect to the Washington area aside from the military personnel in the area. Similar problem propped up in Cleveland when years of controversy led to the abandonment of the name Indians. Uh, So this pro baseball team for the opening of the year, the Cleveland Indians were the Cleveland Guardians. Now, according to local station WKYC, the name comes from a set of statues called the Guardians of Traffic near the ballpark. Who knew? Unless you're from Cleveland, how are you going to know that? So clearly, the best team names, oh, I should say, not everyone was thrilled by this change, not even the team members. Uh, Clevelanders, some Facebook post said, Clevelanders will spend their baseball lifetime explaining it. No one who isn't from Cleveland will have a clue. So clearly, the best team names have clear, strong connections, a a big sense of command. For instance, the Washington Nationals are the national capital. The Pittsburgh Steelers reflect the steel industrial history. And the Orlando Magic is an uh, affirmation of Disney World being there. No one has to explain those names. The connections are strong. And of course, Problems arise when a team moves. Don't get me started with the Arizona Cardinals. I always thought they should be the Arizona Phoenix. Wouldn't that have made a lot of sense? Could have reflected the Southwest origins of of our, our state. The New Orleans Jazz were moved, uh, and it's a clear and strong emotional connection to the word jazz. Who doesn't appreciate New Orleans Jazz? They moved to Utah. The name stopped making sense. See, to be effective, a name needs to be commanding. In the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. The story begins in controversy with Mary being pregnant. They weren't even married yet. They were engaged, although, of course, Jewish engagement was much more involved in those days than it is today. She is found pregnant, and this creates an issue for Joseph, to whom she is pledged to be married. Not wanting to humiliate her, he decides to quietly divorce her and put her aside. You know, according to Jewish law, he could have had her killed, stoned to death. Then the angel says she will give birth to uh, a son. Uh, The angel appears and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph realizes that Mary has not been unfaithful 
She uh, has been made pregnant by the Spirit of God. And then the angel says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's a commanding name. A name to give to his child. Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Matthew tells us that uh, all of this uh, to take place and to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah, you know, the one who liked the long names, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the second commanding name that Jesus is given. Emmanuel means God with us. So when Joseph wakes up, he does what the angels has commanded him. He takes Mary home and his, as his wife, and when she gives birth to a son, he gives him, gives him the name Jesus. Jesus, meaning the Lord saves, literally Yahweh saves. Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. Both are clear, strong, commanding names. What is in a name? We know how important it is for professional sports teams to be given strong names that send a clear message. We know how important it is, or at least was, for movie stars and singers to have powerful, memorable names. But what about biblical names like Jesus or Emmanuel? Professor of Religious Studies Russell Fuller says that the names of individuals in the Bible are always full of meaning, expressing their personality or their status or their nature. In the Bible, a name is always more than just a word. We see this most clearly when a person's name is changed in recognition of their nature or their personality or their status. Jacob's name was changed to Israel after his successful wrestling bout with an angel. Abram's name was changed to Abraham after the creation of this covenant with God. Simon Peter Simon becomes Peter, the rock on whom Jesus will build his church. Saul becomes Paul after he becomes a follower of Christ. The names of newborn children, says Fuller, are carefully chosen to reflect the circumstances of their birth, as well as to indicate something of their personality or their status. The name Moses means to draw out as reflected by Moses' rescue as an infant from the waters of the Nile. The name Miriam, Moses' sister, means to uh, it's a drop of the sea, or bitter, or beloved. A name that is eventually changed and evolves into the name Mary. The name Elijah, the Lord is God. The name Jesus, the Lord saves. The name Emmanuel means God with us. In the Bible, a name is always more than just a word. It expresses personality, status, and nature. So what does it mean to say that the Son of God is both Jesus and Emmanuel? Both names embody who Jesus is the Savior, and God with us. Both invite us to respond, especially this time of year. And not with just cheers like a sports fan, but with deep faith and commitment. Jesus means the Lord saves, so that Jesus will save his people from their sins. Jesus was sent to earth. So, to be the one who saves us from all of our sins and shortcomings that fracture the relationships we have with God and with each other. We make such a mess of our lives as individuals and communities that we need a Savior to rescue us. 
And Jesus does this by offering forgiveness to our sins, for our past feelings, and guidance for the past, the path forward. We might sing about his saving work at Christmas using the words of the carol, A Little Town of Bethlehem. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Cast out our sin. That is the work of Jesus, our Savior. The letter to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus came to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself on the cross. Jesus casts out our sin once and for all in an act that never needs to be repeated on the cross. He lays down his life for us in an act of loving sacrifice, one that brings us forgiveness and new life. We need Jesus to save us. He does for us what we can never do for ourselves, no matter how hard we try. Each of us can be like an addict who discovers that recovery requires turning to a higher power, a power greater than ourselves. When we put our faith in Jesus, the Savior, we find that forgiveness and change are possible. Emmanuel, the second name, communicates that God is with us. Turning to a higher power also helps us to discover that we are not alone. What Emmanuel does in our life, we are then never alone. Using the words from little town of Bethlehem again, we hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, O oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Jesus came to abide with us, to live with us, to stay with us forever. That's the work of Emmanuel, God with us. You don't have to go very far beyond the front page of the newspaper to know how much we need a Savior, maybe now more than ever. You do know, I hope, that loneliness is a problem this time of year, which are why many churches offer the service of the longest night on December 21st. That's Wednesday of this week. It's the day of the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year when the sun sets at its earliest point all year. Elizabeth and I were in Seattle last week, and we thought the days were getting short here. Huh. It's so far north, you kind of forget. Now, today, the sun didn't rise in Seattle until 8 a.m. and will set this afternoon. I say this afternoon, not this evening, at 4.19 p.m. Now, growing up, I remember going to swim practice before and after school. You get there at 6. Actually, I rarely got there by 6. <laughs> and you would leave like at 5.30 that night. You would never see the sun. It was incredible. Now, while we were talking about that, Elizabeth and I agreed. We would never want to repeat high school. Olivia, you might want to cover your ears at this point. There you go. Uh, we were having coffee and decided that, you know, people want to change things in their past from time to time, but we would not want to repeat high school. You know, we know that God loves us because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, but, you know, we know he really loves us because Jesus chose to endure puberty. Okay, you're good now, Olivia. Now that is sacrifice. Elizabeth says maybe that's why Jesus isn't in the Bible, isn't in the Bible so much until he's 30 years old. 
because they don't want to talk about that period in his life. And I said, I don't know, honey. That you know, they they tell us that he ran away when he was twelve to go to the temple. He must have wanted to be with us, to save us. Christians who gather for this longest night service focus their prayers on dark times, the death of a loved one or the loss of a job, living with cancer or adjusting to a divorce or a separation. Churches have discovered that the Christmas season is not a bright and happy member for a time for every member of the congregation. Such services give people opportunities to acknowledge their pain and pray for healing and help. And since the days begin to become longer and longer after the winter solstice, there is reason to believe that people, for people to believe that light can return. Darkness will be overcome. They also find hope in the community that church brings. And boy, I saw that yesterday morning for the ladies who were l- lucky enough to be at the, at the brunch uh, yesterday with all those quiches and the wonderful entertainment. They have discovered that this time of year needs some of that light, needs some of that fun, gives people a chance to acknowledge they might need help. People find hope in community and with the chancer to draw closer to the one who is our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. As we move forward towards Christmas, and oh, it's only a week away, let's keep the commanding names of Jesus and Emmanuel in front of us. Now, I mentioned that at a graveside service I I did on Friday for Jack Foster's mom. I mentioned that not only does God save us, but he doesn't save us and walk away. He saves us, and then he is with us forever. Jesus is our Savior coming to save us from sin and to deliver us a new and abundant life. And he is also Emmanuel, God with us, the surest sign that our Lord is with us in every time, in every place, every situation. With God, we are never trapped in our sins, in our shortcomings. With Emmanuel, we are never completely alone. There's nothing controversial about those names. They're perfect descriptions of God, of the one who commands our faith, our trust, and our deepest commitment. If you find it hard this time of year, contact your deacon or Pastor Bill or myself. We would love to talk to you about whatever you have experienced that does not contribute to joy at this time of year. Consider joining a grace group where you can find support from other Christians. You are not alone. God is with us. Bill and I want to talk with you and share that with you. Now, I'm going to ask Stacy to sing our prayer following the sermon instead of me saying it.
of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angel. With thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness, we give in commitment to God. Ushers, please come forward to receive the morning offering. Praise God from whom all blessings Gracious God, we thank you 
that you are, have given us, you have blessed us with your Son, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, we ask that you uh, bless the offering that we give from our hearts, that it will go out to all the corners of the earth, proclaiming your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A choir sang on their first number, Peace and love are on their way. They should have added, it's just a week away. <laughs> there is something special you will find this week. I don't know what it is. But if you're thinking about Jesus being our Savior and God being with us, it will happen. And it will be an opportunity for you to show that saving, consistent, commanding love of God to somebody else. And when you do, know that you will be blessed by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Try to be like we travel, we travel a lot, so it's kind of fun.